you did not get to that button fast enough on your phone, and then all of a sudden, the Untitled Film Project podcast appears. And here it is. Jim Chandler, Justin Bradford, Jeremy K. Gover. Today, we are talking about Megan, the maniacal robot. Chucky for the 2020s. Uh, And we'll also answer our big question for the week. Which is, if you could cast Knives Out 3, who would be in your cast? Oh, this is going to be good. Megan, or M. Thregan, however you want to refer to her, uh, is a uh, surprise hit in January of 2023, uh, doing very well, consistently making money, bringing in audiences. Uh, Allison Williams plays Gemma, a scientist who works on androids, and all of a sudden she's tasked with having to care for her 10-year-old niece whose parents have just died. But she doesn't have a whole lot of time for her. Gemma just happens to be working on a little girl robot. But that little robot is not a nice robot. I thought I heard something. It sounded like Megan. If she comes in this room, I'll rip your head right off your neck, I swear to God. Don't come in here, Katie. It's kind of a mess. Aunt Gemma's right, Katie. I'm all odds and ends right now. I'd really rather you didn't see me like this. (gasps) It sounds like you're fighting. We're We're not not fighting. fighting. They were fighting. (laughs) Uh, let's get some initial takes on megan and let's start with justin bradford the this movie i did not know what to expect it's it's labeled as as horror and after watching i'm going that's not horror that to me that was not horror that was sci-fi thriller more to me in terms of what i witnessed in this because you know it's because i liked it more than i thought it was going to obviously saw because they said we're going to talk about it it's it's gone viral it's really doing well but in terms of there's horror elements to it but i enjoyed it more for the thriller aspect and the comedy aspect even more so Mm -hmm. because it kicks right off with you laughing over this perpetual pets commercial hilarious the theater i was in just was like oh this is the movie and laughter ensued because it jumps right off with that so it's setting the tone for the movie as in we're not going to take ourselves too seriously in this film right at all so we're just going to set it up right here that don't look at this we don't want you to feel scared we want you to enjoy and i like that aspect of it that they set it right off the bat and plus placing some comedic actors in there as well too like the ceo who plays comedy roles in so many things that he does he's a great stand-up comedian great stand-up comedian as well great netflix special so you put him in there And you already are like, okay, well, there's going to be a funny way that he dies or there's going to be something in here that's going to be funny. Sure. But what I liked about it, too, is that for me, it wasn't overly gory. There was there was some great fight parts to it. There's some little bit of gore, like with the kid in the woods and everything, too. And it's just that I think it was my friend Cameron Gumpy talking about like the uncanny. You know, the where it's like what's going to freak people out just enough, but they can still handle it because it's a humanoid. Like you make it look like a human, but it, it, you can tell it's not a human. And what's the uncomfort level going to be? Seeing them hit with a baseball bat in the head doesn't have the same effect as if they looked more human. Right. And there's no gore because it's like spinning sparks and metal. Sure. And you know it's fake skin there. Well, like in a zombie movie and everything, too. It's like, what, what are they going to do to make an audience feel uncomfortable but still be able to watch it or turn away? Here they did everything right. To make it to where you're not feeling an emotional connection to Megan at all as a human, you still consider it a robot because you know that is not a real person on there. So I think they did a good job with that. I thought it was fun. It was so much fun. I had a lot of fun with this movie. The audience reactions were getting me because I I can tell how this movie is going viral even more so because, and this is analyzing the audience, after it's been out for a few weeks now, right? There are families going to watch it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm in there, and there it's a family of four walking out with a kid that's maybe 11 or 12, to where it, it's because it's not gory, it's not loaded with bad language, mm-hmm. there isn't nudity in it. It's just kind of the scenes can be intense more right. than anything else, right? So you can tell that parents did some research, they waited, they talked to people, but there are full on families going there to enjoy this. That's why it's hard for me to put it as horror, even though obviously it's classified as that for what it is. But to me, I enjoyed it more because it had a more thrilling aspect with comedy. And that's why I liked it. Jeremy Gover. I really enjoyed it as well. But I will say that, and we've talked about this on the show before, I'm not a horror guy. Yeah. So I typically shy away from horror movies. Everything about this film 
from the trailer, I was like, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Right? Same. I'm not because I'm not I'm not that kind of I don't like that kind of movie usually. So so I think it was Jimmy. I think you said, hey, should we all go see Megan because it's getting a lot of buzz? Yeah. And I'm like, damn it, this I don't want I don't want to go. Yeah. See, yeah. I do not want to go see this movie. But I did go see it because of the show, and I am very thankful that I did. It was very enjoyable for the two hours I was in there. Not even two hours. That's what was great about it. No, right. It. I know. It's like hour yes. 47. Like, this is perfect. It Merciful. W- <laughs> it, it had all the horror tones that I expect. Like, the sure. uh, the, the score was, you know, was done mm-hmm. a certain way, and it builds up in certain scenes, and, you, and, and you, you, you're rooting for certain characters and not for others, and... Dolls doing TikTok dances. Uh, right. All, all, the, <laughs> yeah. you know, all the things. What you expect. <laughs> yes. So, it, it really checked all the boxes for me, but it wasn't a slasher movie. That's right. why I liked it. it. it no, right. Yeah, so, there's it, no gore. Yeah, yeah it, it was even even when the uh, even when the um, when Megan pulls the kid's ear off, mm-hmm. it wasn't like like blood spat everywhere, and it was like this. Right. You know, it just you wasn't, see it in a superhero movie sometimes. Sure, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. All in all, I just you know, I I, I really actually liked it, and I'm <laughs> trying to once we get to our scores, I'll tell you, I, I I'm trying to not give it a great score. Because it superseded my expectations. Just respect for what it was. Because I think yeah, that's yeah. that's not fair either way. Right. right. If you go in thinking, mm-hmm. I'm going to love this thing, Black Adam's a great example. I thought, oh, I really want to like this movie. This, I want this to movie. like I it. I want to like it, yeah. <laughs> and then I did not like it. It bum, did not bum, allow bum, you. Right. So that, and I, and I, but I didn't want to take points off for that. I wanted to judge it for what it is. And so I hope to... I hope to do that with Megan here in a few minutes. So go over question because yes. it has been a theme on the show of child actors. Yes. <laughs> what did you think of Violet McGraw's Katie? Everything but the crying scene. Okay. okay. The, her, her crying scene in the uh, therapy room, whatever you call it. Right. The, right. Right. The display room or whatever. Now, the scene itself was awesome because it showed what the robot could do and how it identified this as a problem. Right. They haven't shown the audience that yet. Mm-hmm. And all these. So I was like, okay, I'm into it. But when she turns and says, <laughs> I was like, okay, that's horrific. Is that the best take She's going to play a creepy kid in a future movie. She has that face, the way that she can put her emotions where she can just yes. stare. She has a creepy face factor. She's Wednesday Adams in 2040. When, yeah. But the, the bottom line is I, I really liked her performance, except for that one scene. I thought it was. That's a lot coming from Gover. I thought it was. That is. Comically bad. It is. But yeah. She's not going to get away with a completely no. positive. No, no, the no. kid. No. The kid has to be knocked down a notch or two. Yeah. <laughs> no flawless performances here. Jim, your thoughts. I went into this movie excited for it. You know, my daughter and I, we bond over horror, okay? Because she's a super big horror fan, especially psychological horror, but a- anything. She does like the gore. She does like whatever. So uh, I've come to enjoy and appreciate horror along with her. But both of us, went into this movie the exact same way we did in Haunted House season in the fall, which is we know this is going to be a good time. So we're not going in to be scared. And oh, interesting. that's kind of how the movie turns out. Mm-hmm. Now, you talked about whether it was a horror movie. I'm going to say this is a comedy with elements of horror that simply serve up the comedy. Because right. I haven't laughed that hard. And, <laughs> and, and they were all in intentional places. Yes, it was meant by, to make you by laugh. By the filmmakers, you know? So I got what I wanted out of it. I definitely, I call this a fun house movie. Okay? So you're going through, you know, a fun house at a carnival, and you turn a corner, and all of a sudden, one of those hydraulic puppets that looks like <laughs> a skull just goes and, and surprises you. And for a millisecond, you might have a little bit of, oh, scared. But for the majority of the next five seconds, you're laughing your butt off. So that's what Megan was for me. And it delivered. I loved, I really had a great time. Now, how about this, though, with the viral marketing campaign that we saw with this, plus we saw with Smile. Brilliant. Seeing similar things like this for Smile, especially during World Series. During baseball playoffs, Ooh. having to stand up behind home plate right there with the camera view. Same thing with Megan. People dressing up in the doll outfits and doing the dance and everything. Very creepily, not blinking. I mean, yep. those types of campaigns help a thing go viral, especially when you look at this. 
the budget of the film was twelve million dollars. Yep. Yeah. And it was, it's made I, I over one hundred twenty four million. Well, I was gonna get to that. Yeah. I looked <laughs> at, I looked it up actually as we were walking out of the theater. I go, I wonder if that's the most money that uh, Blumhouse, the production company mm-hmm. that makes these these movies, I wonder how much they put into it because that was that was pretty good. And I come to find out it's not even close to the most expensive movie they've made. I think nineteen million is the most they've ever spent on a movie. But yeah, twelve million? And I was like money. That that is that is I mean, obviously it's it is one of the most lucrative genres to make because it's not expensive to do horror. And the return is always very good if you do it halfway decent. This thing is a phenomenon and just like what what Chucky was what in the eighties. This is going to be for the 2020s. They've already greenlit the next one. They teased and, it and everything too. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you know, this is going to be this. This is a franchise now. And you think too, with the actors they brought in, they didn't have to spend a lot of money uh-uh. on right. those actors. They didn't have a huge background in their but they, profiles, but they got ones that fit the roles pretty well. Well, no, but they also got ones that could act. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, a lot of horror movies. That one of the reasons that I don't like them that much. <laughs> one because I don't. I'm not. I'm like, ooh, scare me. But right. also another part of it is because <laughs> usually they they are going for bottom of the barrel actors like hey sure we got this you know not there's anything wrong with serving I did it for ten years but we got this server in Hollywood who wants to be an actor and he's taking minimum wage and we're gonna put you know it's Seems just, a little extreme right but I'm just saying like it's, yeah they're, it's, they're it's not, a good enough Jimmy put it perfectly it's <laughs> he's that actor is good enough I, I really like immediately uh, you know you notice that okay Allison Williams she's pretty good you know we know her from Girls we know her from Get Out. She's been kind of quiet lately. She said, I think she had a child in real life and just took some time off. But, uh, you know, she's a pretty competent actress. And I was very impressed by Violet McGraw, who plays her niece. I think uh, she had a good portion of scenes in, in this movie. And with the exception of that one that Gover doesn't <laughs> like, is trying to keep her in check. You can't tell me it was good. Come on. Uh, it, it didn't stand out to me as horrible, but uh, I thought overall. It seemed staged. It, it was like, the, Because oh, it was, but I mean, yeah, it seemed staged for the it, film, that meaning it wasn't acted the best. It was the only part of the entire movie that I was reminded that I was watching a performance. Okay. And which that's is a problem. A, which is a compliment to the rest of the movie. Yes, it is. It wasn't the animatronic doll killing no. a kid and making it run. A because, bus run. Okay. because the way they built the story. <laughs> okay. I was like, I'm on board. I got it. You, you're a toy company. You make this thing. You fail. Funky. The, not Funko. Funky, not Funko. But Funky, who funky. has this high rise building. Which, and they're like, F you, Hasbro. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> The tomato meter on this from critics. I'm sure it's 94%. Yeah, I'm sure it's high. Really high. Yeah, 79% yeah. audience score. But critics love this movie because of the mix of comedy and how it meshes yeah. into the storyline so well that it was meant to be there to drive the horror for and, it. And for the people that don't follow the Rotten Tomatoes critics versus audience score, for a horror movie dumped in January. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. This never happens. This is best <laughs> picture material. That's right. how you get, I mean, that's <laughs> right. How. right. Yeah. You get, oh, it's the story of this like poor, you know, bulldog who gets, you know, half <laughs> oh, run over. Oh my and God. And for, for an hour and a half, he tries to pull himself across the street yes. and it's in black and white and it's in French. And he's a French bulldog. And, you know, and then the audience hates it, but, you know, a super snooty critic is going, this is the most marvelous take on. <laughs> The, the the troll of human existence, you know. So I yeah, love his critic Jim's a vibe tonight. I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that is wild that the critics loved this and the audience liked it a lot, but not as much as. You know. So if we see a twenty four come out with a movie about a bulldog, <laughs> it's black and white. We'll know. We know they're listening. What? And thank you so much, a twenty four, for listening. <laughs> I'll screen cap the file name of this and we'll sue them for copyright. All right. Let me just say, uh, like, you know, as a, I'm an A24 cultist, you know, I, I, I really love, love them. So, uh, you know, and there's, there's a, uh, it's kind of you know, the Marvel DC comparison, you know, the fans, there is a A24 Blumhouse, you know, rivalry and Blumhouse is your, you know, cheaper, schlockier, you know, A24 is more your art house. And so the, don't bring A24 into this because yeah, you're muddying the name. You're, you know, this is not good. I am so sorry to offend you. A24, <laughs> please send Jim a shirt, uh, a Jim, t-shirt. Jim is a- shirt. What's your size, Jim? Is it large? Uh, yeah, large. large a large t-shirt guy. for Jim would be great. I'm so yeah. sorry. Thank Jim you. is uh, a, they're, they're a new PR guy. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> well, when I went to go see this, uh, I went with my daughter and her boyfriend 
And when the movie was over, we, we kind of had these stunned faces of delight as the credits start rolling. And my daughter's boyfriend just says, wow, we just got Blumhoused. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard Blumhoused as a verb, <laughs> but now it's out there. It is now. Now we know. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, good sci-fi, because there's an element of sci-fi here, uh, is, is always a commentary on, on society. And I do love that this, as cheesy as this movie was, and it tried to be, there's some legitimate discussions you can have about what robots' roles are. And they're already talking about, they're less about children, but more about helping seniors, keeping seniors from being lonely. And so they went to just the next logical step with absentee parenting. I'll give you one more. Yeah. Screen time. Yes. This, the screen time argument is sure. a big one in my house. We limit McGillney's screen time, my son's screen time, to, uh, I don't know, it's like an hour a day during the week because he's so busy otherwise. Yeah. Uh, but then the weekend, it's like, you know, five hours yeah. total. But that's like, you know, that's video games upstairs, it's on his phone, it's all that stuff. But this movie deals with that quite a bit. It doesn't deal with it as a, as a, on a whole, but, but it, you can it, see the danger of it, the psychological oh, yeah. danger of, well, if you're too connected to this thing or a screen right. or a phone. The or emotional whatever, attachment that came The emotional made. attachment, you start to lash out emotionally because you're not, you know, if you're a kid. You know. So it, yes. it, was, it was interesting. Those Again, attachments are real. It wasn't trying to slap you across the face with it, but it was there. And I, yeah. I, I appreciated that. So the therapist, when the character was first introduced, mm-hmm. did piss me off a little bit. Yeah. Because this is right after the the car accident and she comes in is like play what don't you want to talk or anything you just want to see them play together who who comes in and instructs people to just actually actually i think you're going to have a lot of therapists that will say yeah that's that's a thing especially with young yeah i'm waiting for the first therapist to comment and say hey but that's what i didn't like though because there was no discussion at all but that's their job to do that i know but should they not be talking to assess the situation they're the professional dude if they think that just what I'm saying is I didn't like how it was portrayed in the movie. The movie could have led us to that with just a sentence or two. Just a little bit of sentence or two. Like, it, because I'd it basically like to see felt how like... you get along. Let's have you guys Right. Basically what it says to me is that Gemma was not even prepared or told what's going to happen in this visit. Just that there's going to be a visit. And typically oh, yeah. she you needed, would think... She needed the therapist more than... Uh, well, right. Well, <laughs> but you would, think, you would think that if this visit is going to happen, it's like, hey, as a heads up, here's how this visit's going to go. And I know I'm nitpicking here, so drink. <laughs> I'm nitpicking here, but it's just one of those things that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It's like, of course, they would have told you what's going to come up at least. They wouldn't just throw you off and throw you a, a screw loose because they're not trying to screw you over if the kid's best interests really are at hand here. Right. They want to make sure that the best things are going to happen. So they're not going to try to get a do a gotcha on this. They're trying to really evaluate. So you think they'd give a heads up of, hey, this is how it's going to go. And Gemma seemed like she had no idea. One. The parents can sometimes manipulate that if they're given the game plan ahead of they time. They can, yeah, so but she's not a parent. She's so an Therefore, aunt. there is no gotcha. It's like, I really, we really want to see as close as possible. Yeah, We're not going to give you a heads up. Secondly, I, was, I didn't notice that because I was distracted by the amazing subplot, if you will, of the she collects toys. Yeah. And yes. the toys are not to be played with. Yeah. As a collector myself. Well, we all was, like that, right? That, was, uh, that, that really hit home. Yeah. And she's like, you're not, oh, you can't play with those. Those are right. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. You can't play with those. I don't care, you know. And then she's like, "Fine, you want me to open it?" And she just rips it open. I was like, oh. "I mean, like, I don't even know what the right. toy is, what right. the value is." Right. But I, as a collector, you're not I, even showing how the toy works. My soul, <laughs> yeah, had a little chunk taken out of it because she ripped open this supposedly expensive toy. The, the therapist survived, right? I don't. I think so. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, therapist should have died. Hmm. I don't think so because of what I'm going to say when we get to our scores. Okay. Oh, ton, ton, ton. All right. Well, I'm just going to say she was. Still a lousy therapist, as we all in the theater can realize that Gemma is totally self-involved and cannot care for a small child. But you're like, yeah, there's all these warning signs. There's, I can't even see for through all the red flags. But um, yeah, we'll just let this keep going. <laughs> then we wouldn't have had a movie either. <laughs> but it kind of ups the stakes. I guess. I guess. <laughs> Scores. Let's do it. <laughs> Start with Jeremy Gover because you just talked about you wanted to get into something, but not until scores. Yes. So the opening commercial about a family's dog dying, Mm. hilarious. 
It was great. That's coming from a dog guy. I want everybody to know that I, I love me <laughs> yeah. some dogs. I've fostered dogs. Like my family and I have fostered dogs, and uh, we, we absolutely love dogs. But the way they presented them, the way they kicked off the movie was with a dog dying commercial and then replacing it with a, a Furby. A, yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, pretty much. So that, <laughs> that set the tone for the rest of the film. But it also disarmed me. As somebody who doesn't like horror movies, and I thought I was going to walk in and be like, oh, I really want to watch it. It's very uncomfortable. I don't want to watch this. I thought that was a trick to disarm me. And I thought that it worked, but I was like, I don't like it, right? You know, uh, they have a budget, as Bradford said, a budget of $12 million is made over $130 million. Is this because it's rated PG-13? And if so, will we see a trend now going forward for all these? Because we know what Hollywood does. They see something that's mm-hmm. successful, and then they try to, they try to re- recreate it as best as possible. And so are we going to see a run of horror, air quotes for radio, PG-13 movies? I think that's entirely possible. Uh, I think every every movie maker knows that once you hit R, mm-hmm. a huge portion of your movie going audience it drops out. So it's got to be so good or so anticipated by the movie going public that they, you know, an R rating isn't going to matter. So the fact that this made a lot of money, I, I think it very well could usher in very similar movies, a, an era of movies. I think there's a Blair Witch parallel here. And that is that when you watch Blair Witch Project, and again, this is coming from a non-horror guy, mm-hmm. when, when I watched Blair Witch Project, I was enamored with the fact that they didn't use anything visually horrific. Yeah. It was all audio. So you're watching a black and white film, and there's creaks and cracks in the, in the darkness of the woods, and there's anticipation just based on vocals. I don't think there was, anything, there was a score, was there? Because it was supposed to be a home movie, so there's no, no there score. No, there was no score. Yeah, so there, all, all these little audio things are what's actually the horror part of it. Yeah. And I applauded the fact that it was different. This is a, not a parallel, but I'll say that there's similarities to this because it wasn't gory. It wasn't, you know, horrific that way. You, got, you said it was more than more of a comedy, Jim. I think so. Right. So, but it's still considered a horror movie. And I would actually still consider it a horror movie because there is a main character who turns evil Ooh. and tries to do all these different things. Right. So I, I really, I found that very interesting. I love that Megan's aggression was always against somebody who deserved it. Against her, according to her protocol, until right. the end, the dog, you know, bites bit, bit Katie. Yeah. Bites, yeah. bites Katie. She takes it out on the dog. Yep. And then the she's the protecting next, the next door neighbor is threatens, harassing the family, yep. threatens it, takes care of the next door neighbor. Mm-hmm. Then the kid at camp picks on Katie, bullies Katie. It doesn't kill the kid, but you know the the accidents lead to. The kid dying. I okay. mean, yeah. she might have known what was coming. Yeah. Sure, but I, I'm just saying like, different she, degrees of manslaughter. She has GPS. <laughs> yes, that's so, right. So that's true. <laughs> probably detected a vehicle. I was like, ah, let's chase him. <laughs> <laughs> so so but my point is that until until Gemma at the end, it was all the all of her victims were, according to her protocol, deserved. Yeah. Because it was protecting Katie emotionally yes. and physically. And so I think yeah. that was a very interesting thing. It wasn't just like this thing went nuts. And it yeah. murdered everybody and the innocent postman who's delivering the mail. It was just, it was certain. I, I really liked that. So basically what I was saying is I was rooting against those characters anyway. <laughs> and then they got what they deserved. But you're saying the kid had to die. I'm saying that, yes. <laughs> right. Along, all that being said, I gave it a solid 7.5. Wow. I it was not expecting super that. Super enjoyable. I was entertained, thoroughly entertained by it. And again, all those little things like the villain took care of the bad people and the, right. and the, and the you know, like it was... It was a great blend of comedy, all those things. I really loved it. 7.5 for me. All right. Didn't expect it from the non-horror guy. I am the I child expected, actor hater. Don't forget that. Yeah, I right. expected it to be a mid-score from Gover, even though he liked it, because that would be typical Gover, so I'm very surprised. <laughs> I'm very shocked. <laughs> Justin Bradford. Okay. So, for this movie. Yes, I enjoyed it. It was interesting, because honestly, I forgot it was PG-13. I thought it was R, because they got their one F-bomb in there, so now it makes even more sense that they didn't have all of that and that they didn't show the actual mutilations happening or the kills happening. They show the after effects like the blood in the elevator, things of that sort. And why I explain so many more teenagers were in there being teenagers in a sure. horror movie. I do think it might have gotten lost in the Halloween mix of everything because what was it? The last Halloween movie was what was getting all the hype then, right? Mm, right. With Jamie Lee Curtis. So I well, think there's also Smile. And there's there's also so many ones. other ones yeah. going viral. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a time right after Christmas. It's like... Let's get right back in here and creep people out. Why not? Yeah. Um, and because it's such a slow movie season, as we all know right now, we're mm-hmm. past award season. 
it's a time to strike. There's not much being released. So if you get something and you have a feeling it could go hey, viral. Hey, 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 no disrespect to House Party. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. If you I'm can sorry, strike in this house, we in a do not slow, disrespect House Party. <laughs> in a slow time, like they have, they have absolutely hit the jackpot here on making yeah. this much money on a movie where they're like, you know what? Let's just make double what we spent and we'll be happy probably. Mm-hmm. And then they probably have this inkling of, you know, this could go viral after the trailers and seeing how things are happening on TikTok and things like that's where people are picking up on that, how viral it could go. They struck gold there. And so I love the comedy aspect of it, especially like the, the way they just brought your guard down in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, this is hilarious. It's yeah. a freaking Furby. So I invite all of you, please, if you have them still, turn on your Furbies, <laughs> make sure they're connected to the internet and let's just see what happens. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> make your own perpetual pets out there. Uh, with that, the comedy, the thriller aspect of it, the, the how we know we're going to get another one already too, and the way they teased it, I give it a seven. I really did enjoy it. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, it's not what I expected, and that's why I liked it. Jimmy, Jim, what you got? I cannot tell you how much I laughed at the song and dance numbers, which I believe there was two, but the one that I really, really laughed at was. Titanium, <laughs> David Guetta, her singing that song, and it took me a few seconds. I, like you know, that is, I'm a morning radio top forty person by <laughs> trade, so you know that song is ingrained in my head, and I'm sitting there going, "What song is she? <gasps> oh my god, that's hilarious!" Uh, I just, I that it, I've, it seems maybe an obvious joke, but it just struck me as something so funny. She I didn't expect sang- to hear robot singing. Yeah, I, re- I, yeah I didn't expect any singing at all. There were a few s- shots staged where there could have easily been another one of her, and it looked like the twins mm-hmm. from The Shining. I agree with that. So, like, like the hallway know. before she starts dancing? Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. a great example. And then grabs the paper cutter <laughs> as a sword. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, goes all samurai on it. Yeah. yeah. And my, my nitpicking is is very little. For Allison Williams' character, Gemma, to, to go from completely oblivious to the needs of a child and seeing all these horrible things and still being oblivious. And then she just, I don't know, on a dime, she turned into like, oh, wait, no, this, I think this is bad for a child. Like, I, they just didn't walk me through it. <laughs> and while it was fun to see Megan get down on all fours like a wolf and chase the little bully, people around me were even yelling out, why isn't she just running on two legs? She'd be a lot faster. So, like, yeah, that's my <laughs> nitpick, right? <laughs> because it's a horror creep type yeah, of trope. Yeah, yeah, because you had to see her as a beast, right? Yeah, crab walk and exorcist. Sure. I mean, it's all, you know, all fours. It's all in there. Horror thing, yeah. Exactly. And that, that tick that box there on that one. All in all, I enjoyed this movie thoroughly. It didn't try to be anything it wasn't supposed to be. It leaned into it and did it so well. And... Unlike Violent Night, I think instead of you know taking a '90s movie like Die Hard and saying okay we're going to put Santa Claus in it and then not do a good enough job with that oh, twist, Jim. I know I'm bringing up oh, Violent Jim. Night You're again. You're bringing up an awful bad take. Yes, too. I am. He's, he's speaking my language right now. Yeah. He's speaking a language that hardly anybody agrees uh, with. I, I, well, I, I two or three hosts in this room. Yeah. All right now I got a majority. Oh, because that I'm means everything. <laughs> but I thought they took the Chucky idea. And they modernized it. And then when they went into the interesting ways it could work out and the funny things that could happen, they paid off. Whereas for me, Violent Night, they did not. So I gave Megan a solid seven. uh, And I can't believe I'm giving a Blumhouse movie a seven. (laughs) But I was thoroughly entertained. So now it's time to answer our big question. The big question this week comes from me, technically, but really it was inspired by a tweet that I saw about a month ago, and I texted the guys, and I go, we have got to talk about this whenever we can, and we figured this is a great opportunity to do so. I want everyone in this room, and then you listening, to cast the next Knives Out movie. So (laughs) obviously you have, okay, Daniel Craig as Benoit Blanc. Okay, you have that. Sure, it's good. Cross it off your list. Okay, that's the whole point of Knives Out is this guy. Okay, but everybody else is fair game. Right. So I want to hear everyone's casting of Knives Out 3. All right. Well, who would you like to go first? I'm going to go with Bradford first. 
Okay. Because he texted with, I'm horrible at these things. <laughs> <laughs> so let's put it so on display. So let's put him, yeah, let's, okay. let's, let's kick off with it. Okay, so what I was thinking of with this is I was trying to get people that have comedic backgrounds, yep. but aren't necessarily stand-up comedians. I love the fact that we have an explanation because I have one as well. That right. they Ooh. have good comedic timing, but they also can do serious um, that they've yep. been in roles where they have to be serious, but also have a little bit of dark comedy and dark humor behind it as well. People that are hot, but not necessarily hot right now all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but people also that could be award worthy, would, we, we wouldn't expect them in this as well, too. Mm -hmm. And went for a great diversity in terms of the cast of different things that we've seen them in in different genres as well, from TV to film and everything. I love so, all this. It, it, pretty much okay. everything you just said was my mindset, Same. too. Good. We're okay. all on the same page, right? There. Okay, good. So I'm just going to name all of them. I have seven because the casts are big. Yep. The casts are big. So I went with seven people. Stop right there. Jimmy, how many do you have? Uh, let's see. <laughs> I have eight. I also have eight. Okay. All right. And, all I, right. and I, I did that because I looked at the first two movie casts, the ensemble cast, not Benoit Blanc. Right. And I said, how many people are really are in this yeah as a true superstar not daryl who walks to the screen in the second one. i'm you know real people <laughs> right and i came up with okay eight's a good number okay so let's hear your but seven seven okay and uh do you have you worked out the premise of the movie or is no. just casting that's all, that's up to okay. ryan johnson yeah it's just yeah. casting okay <laughs> just yeah don't do star wars again uh <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, once again, I liked Last Jedi. I just want to make sure that I'm on record. That you're I just wanted continuity in the storyline, okay? Anyways, yeah. kicking it off, Aubrey Plaza. Ooh. She's terrific. Okay, Jennifer Coolidge. Okay. Ooh. So we've got uh, two people two white on noise. White Lotus. Uh, oh, white white Lotus, yes. Yeah, so not White season. Noise. White Lotus. Sorry. White noise, <laughs> There's yeah. so many things. with. Okay, Colin Farrell. All right. Because he can be funny. Uh, he definitely yes. can be. Daniel Radcliffe. I almost put him on my list. Because I love what he is coming out with so much. He's been doing stuff on Broadway, but I really liked his role in, oh gosh, what's the one with Sandra Bullock that just came out, The Lost City? Yeah. I loved him playing the comedic villain role in that. <laughs> I think it'd be fun. Uh, Winston Duke. All right. We see him in Black Panther. Yep. Um, Tessa Thompson. Because we know just yeah. based on her, her yeah. time in, in Thor and everything that she can be funny. She's and good. Simu Liu. Nice. So okay. I have a feeling with that mix of cast, there are some different age gaps as well, which I'd like to see that they could cast that in different ways with what these characters are, depending on which direction they go to. But again, I think the star that I'd really want to see most of in this would be Aubrey Plaza because yep. she is really coming on quick and she was great on SNL. Yep. She was really good in White Lotus. She's just really, she is, she's coming up big time, even more. I think she's going to get more big roles, but I think that cast could be a lot of fun. With their comedic timing together. Excellent. All right. Jimmy, you want to go ahead and give us yours there, sir? Sure. I <laughs> also consider a lot of those things. You got to pick people who are maybe a little offbeat, have a little comedic timing, maybe not to a certain star level. And you also want to get some of the young people that are, you know, I kind of on the rise, like you mm -hmm. said. So I'm going to start that by saying, here's my oldest person on the list. But he is going to, uh, well, as you say, play a main role, like the Miles role okay. in uh, in Glass Onion. J.K. Simmons. <laughs> you love J.K. Simmons. I love me some J.K. Yeah. Simmons. I also throw in Allison Janney. Now she's mm. she's got some chops. Mm -hmm. So does J.K. Simmons, right? Sure. Okay, so that's now. Now we're gonna we're gonna take it to the uh, kind of different places. All right. So I've got uh, Quinta Brunson. Oh yes, oh, that fantastic. would be great. I really think. God, I, wish I was thinking about. I wish her I had too. thought of that. Yes. I don't know what what role she could play, but I know she she'd be really good. Uh, I did pick up a, a stand up comedian that I don't know has done any acting, but uh, Tig Notaro. Yes, oh. <laughs> I, I just yes. What a great great choice. <laughs> uh, you, you know, as a as a comedian, God, makes my soul so happy, and a, and a storyteller, and and just the way words uh, come out, I think she would just, it would be phenomenal. Seemingly you. I also picked <laughs> No it. way. I did. I think uh, kind of a perfect palate cleanser, Nick Offerman, I think would be so much fun. Interesting. I don't know if I could see him in some, I mean, you know, that's up to his acting chops to prove me otherwise. Sure. But so I he's not on Gover's list. No. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. Then you go with like one of the hottest actresses right now is Jenna Ortega. Mm. Okay. I think she'd be perfect. And the last one, 
just to stir things up, and he's done dramatic roles. It's my second stand-up comedian. Oh. Dave Chappelle. Oh, that'd be that, great. That is, I mean. I'll drink like, to that. Stir in the pot. And I'll tell you, like, if I had to give an elevator pitch to the movie, I would say that uh, J.K. Simmons is the only one who isn't playing a version of himself. Because you've got to have people with a lot of money and a lot of, uh, you know, clout in these movies, it, it seems. So J.K. Simmons is either a, a studio chief or a uh, an agent in Hollywood, and everybody else is playing a version of themselves in this movie, and they all have a reason to want to kill him. I don't see a studio casting Dave. No, they probably so don't. Divisive. But that's why I yeah. get to have this like no. fantasy division here. Okay, yeah. but and this is goes, this is going to parlay into my first pick because Dave Chappelle is friends with and under contract with Netflix. Yeah, Knives Out is a Netflix property right now. I can't see other actors agreeing to work with him right now. Well, that's true. That's but then the again, okay. That's only uh, this is why this is my Dave has my gone off fantasy the deep end. cast. I understand that, but. A lot of time on these, a lot of times on these projects, people put their personal things aside. A lot of times they do. It's, you know, my point is, I guess, is that he's under Netflix umbrella. Yeah. So it's a perfect scenario there. It could be a Johnny Depp type role, like in um, Murder on the Orient Express, mm-hmm. where he's in the movie for like five minutes. Right. He doesn't have to be in the whole film. Yeah. It could be a really quick part. He could be the one killed for crying out loud, right, right. off the top, and then that's where it's. To, yeah, they, they could fit him in for sure. Okay. That's a great, that's a great. great so pick. I would love to hear Jeremy Gover's cast of Knives Out 3. Okay. My first pick is Jenna Ortega because she is under the, <laughs> Netflix, the Netflix, Netflix umbrella. She's young. She's an up and coming actress. And again, she's checks all the boxes. She's tremendous. I really, really, really like her a lot. The next person is Julianne Moore. I Ooh. love Julianne Moore. There okay. needs to be kind of a an elder statesman of the group, and yes. I think she and you could do a lot worse than Julianne Moore. She's she, tremendous. Oh yeah, if so, you saw her in Thirty Rock, she is funny. Yeah, and so and the, oh. it would be, be really really great. Here's my here's my selfish. Well, I have two of them, but this is the one that is really selfish and it's like a really a reach because I don't know if you could actually do it or not, but yeah. I want to see it happen. Is David Spade? Adam Sandler has been on record many times. Not that I necessarily trust Adam Sandler's impression, but he knows David Spade. Like they're like really good friends, right? And he said that. He has said many on many occasions David Spade should do a more dramatic role. He would be really good at it. So this is my... I would like to this, see that. Since, <laughs> this, since this is a fantasy, I figured, you know what? Let's see if he can do it. Shoot your shot. Yeah, exactly. And he's also under the Netflix umbrella, by the way, so that works. Peter Dinklage <laughs> is my oh, next one. Oh, that's a great one. I, he has been that's great one. in multiple... He's great at everything he does. So I'd love to see him. Ming-Na Wen. <laughs> Tusu Beidou for The Woman King. Yes. I'd like to see, I knew he was going to gonna, pull one I, of those. Hey, gonna sneak that in. Gonna, if, if we can't nominate her as best actor, best supporting actress. I'm putting her in somewhere else. Those of you, if you're <clears throat> new to the Untitled Film Project podcast, we all loved the movie The Woman King, didn't get a lot of attention. And uh, Tusa Abedu, Abedu, Tusa Abedu mm-hmm. uh, is the you know very young actress in that movie that stunned all of us. And Gover is... You are her agent. I am. I am her PR manager at yeah. this point. That's, you're, for, you're, that's true. You're her DJ Khaled. <laughs> her hype man. Except you know how old she actually is. She's like thirty, isn't she? Thirty-one. Yeah, but she played like but an she eighteen plays year old. Like young so yeah, well. It was She's really, that really good. good. So again, then you have Jenna Ortega and her. Maybe could be best friends. I mean, you know who knows, right? So right. And then my last two are Camille Nanjani. Uh, I okay. think he would be tremendous. Oh yeah. And then my last one is this one's also selfish, but he's done dramatic roles before, and I think again as a part of an ensemble cast. It could be really strong. Dave Matthews. I was in an Adam Sandler movie. Yeah. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. But it's <laughs> also awesome where the red fern grows. There's a couple other things. But my point of this is he has he has acting chops enough to get it done. Again, we're not, I'm not asking him to star in it. Sure. Just a, you know, a, a supporting role. And it's a Knives Out movie. So a Knives Out a movie, right? And, you, and if you look at my list, you've got all ages. You've got a racial diversity. Genders. And you've also got... A profession diversity. David Spade, yes, he's done acting, but he's a stand-up comedian first. Yep. Then you have classically trained actors and actresses. Sure. And you have to have a musician in there, I think, because then it starts drawing curiosity from those different pools. Very nice. So I went full strategic. So I want to know what the listeners think. So do I. Which cast would you want to see out of the three of ours? Yeah. And then two, you cast it. 
and let's see what you have to say about the next Knives Out cast. I want to I want to see what people think and what they want to see on screen as well in terms of just chemistry and everything because the two casts have done so well together as an ensemble. Thank you for joining the Untitled Film Project podcast. I am Jim Chandler. Jeremy Kagover. Justin Bradford. We'd love to hear your feedback on anything we've said on this episode, whether it be about the big question or whether it be, of course, about Megan. We want to hear from you. You can follow us on all the social medias at Untitled Film Project. I just like to toss it to Bradford, <laughs> even though I know what it is because he's the social media guy. Well, it's so. on links. Just go to our link tree. It's on our Twitter profile. It's not an untitled film project. You'll find some other things, but then you're going to find us and you're going to know which one is us. It's really easy to find. Thanks. Thanks for spending time with us. We're going to go bicker in our spare time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Untitled Film Project podcast. To support the show, please rate, review, follow, and subscribe. Original music by Jeremy Schwartz. Special thanks to the Music City Film Critics Association. Editing and post-production by Jeremy K. Gover. Voiceover by Chad Bennett. The Untitled Film Project podcast is presented in cooperation with iHeartRadio.